So let's meet tonight's speaker. 30 years of passionate study in whiskey led Jay Arisman to co-found New Rift Distilling in Newport, Kentucky, where he serves today as Vice President of Strategic Development, Head Blender, Distiller, and Fourth String Truck Driver. From 2001 to 2014, Jay ran the groundbreaking Fine Spirits and Education Program at iconic Kentucky liquor retailer, The Party Source. Working closely with Kentucky's bourbon distiller, uh, distilleries to create new whiskeys, as a whiskey writer, Jay's work has appeared in Whiskey Advocate and Distiller, among other publications. Jay, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me, Heather. And Thank thanks, to the, thanks to the Behringer Crawford Museum uh, for all of this. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, the Behringer for some time, but uh, of course, haven't been able to really be in there um in recent years unfortunately thanks to the plague and uh, do look forward to some visits uh in the future and uh, getting into some of the archives there and seeing if there are some uh additional um historical materials that, that I, I might be interested in and avail myself of i'm a history buff myself folks ask sometimes well, what did what did you do in school to prepare yourself for this and of course i was an english major uh, proof that liberal arts majors can do anything, right? And I helped start uh, a distillery. So uh, I'm a, a writer and a historian, and I, I approach a lot of uh, my work here from a uh, critico and historical uh, sort of perspective. And uh, one of that, one fun part of that for me is delving into the history of uh, the local distilleries and, and, and greater Cincinnati and sort of knowing what we are uh, getting ourselves into or, or knowing what if we are going to uh, pre be as as the back of our bottle says, a new riff on an old tradition, then we have to know what that tradition is, and that includes not only the liquid uh, tradition that's going on there, but uh, but to to know uh, what came before us and what is that tradition. And in our uh, estimation, it's more than just Bardstown and Kentucky bourbon is not just in Louisville. Northern Kentucky has a, a grand and long history of contributing to our state's native spirit and the history thereof. And uh, we are one of uh, a number of entities that are helping to, to bring that back, I guess. So uh, before I go into uh, the obligatory slideshow, uh, let me uh, just go over a, a number of facts about New Rift. So um, we are uh, New Rift Distilling. We uh, were founded and opened in 2014. And we started selling our whiskey at the age of four in 2018. And now we are in about 16, soon to be 17 states uh, across the country. And we're making our way in the world of whiskey. Uh, we make uh, primarily bourbon and rye whiskey, along with a host of other whiskeys uh, here and there. And we make a gin as well, uh, Kentucky Wild Gin, that captures the flavor of uh, Kentucky and the Ohio Valley thanks to uh, local foraged wild botanicals. Um, here is one of our core products. Uh, I hope you have a bottle on your desk to enjoy. We can do a toast at the end uh, to uh, toast our, our good fortune. Uh, this is our New Riff Kentucky Straight Whiskey and, and it's embossed on the bottle here, some language that I love called bottled in bond. That's a bottled in bond whiskey. Um, it is uh, adhering to the standards of the 1897 Bottled and Bond Act that was uh, not only the act that began to really give protection to good straight whiskey as a product, but even was the first product protection act in America. How American of us, by the way, to say nothing of Kentucky of us, that the first thing we protected was not, not the baby food or the aspirin. The first thing we protected was the whiskey. Protect the whiskey first. And that is the Bottled and Bond Act. So everything we make at New Riff is uh, adhering to this Bottled and Bond Act, which is still today the world's highest standard of quality uh, for a brown spirit, for an aged spirit, higher than the standards in Scotland and cognac and, and places like that. Um, it is uh, uh, our, our flagship uh, whiskey, uh, that Bottled and Bond bourbon, and uh, in fact, Conveniently, uh, that Bottled and Bond Act, uh, to delve into a little more history, uh, it's often credited to Kentucky's distillers at the time in the 1890s who were, were upset with all of the low grade, blended, rectified whiskey that was being made uh, and ab about which more in a moment about where it was being made and who was making it. Uh, but they, they were upset at the quality of this whiskey and they said, 
darn it, we make the good whiskey here in, in America. We make true Kentucky bourbon. We need to get this protected. And the distillers led the charge to get this legislation passed in uh, 1897. But the real guy, the, the person really responsible for pushing it through Congress was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time uh, named uh, John G. Carlisle. John G. Carlisle, a former Kentucky senator, and I believe also a representative, and at, at this time was the Secretary of the Treasury. John G. Carlisle, native of, does anyone know, drum roll please, Covington, Kentucky. And he is buried there today. So we believe that, that this standard has a, a lot of its you know, origin in the north of Kentucky and the story thereof. So that is New Riff. Uh, as I said, we opened in 2014. Uh, this picture behind me, of course, it's not nighttime at New Riff. This is just a picture on my Zoom. But if you see right here where my hand is, there's a little square of concrete right there on the, the pavement. And that is the top of our well. The first thing we did when owner of the party source, Ken Lewis, uh, decided we should build this, this distillery, uh, the first thing we did was, was to go looking for a better source of water than the city of Newport. And it's not because Newport's water isn't good, although I must say I've had better. <clears throat> it's because we wanted to find a special water. That is the origin of any whiskey distillery. The beginning of the flavor and the quality of the bourbon is, is what water do you use? And we found underneath the distillery, right there on the land that we own, 100 feet down is, a, is an aquifer. The aquifer is partly fed by uh, the river, but primarily fed by the hills to the south of us. You know how you come down 471 or I-75? What do you do? You go down a hill, right? That hill is full of limestone deposits. You can see them in the cut in the hill. You can see them in the cut that's made by 471. Those limestone deposits are uh, the, the northernmost outcropping of the limestone formation that sits under all of central Kentucky. And it comes up to these, these uh, hills in northern Kentucky and it goes down the hills, it goes into our aquifer. So we actually do get a fantastic limestone mineral water that we pull out of this manhole right here <laughs> and it goes into our distillery where we use it for uh, cooling processes and uh, save therefore a, a tremendous amount of green energy uh, we don't burn as much electricity at all as if we didn't have that water. Uh, but it also is the water that becomes this whiskey. And so we are making something uh, unrepeatable in, uh, in other locations without that wonderful water supply. So that, that's something to those of us here in Northern Kentucky who know the geography and the lay of the land, I think could be interested in that those hills you drive down are this whiskey eventually that you get to drink. So I wanna share with you a, a presentation uh, that I've done uh, several times over the years, and it's, it's evolved and changed uh, through, through the way as I start to get more and more information um, as the amateur historian that I am. Um, if anyone uh, has a trouble seeing this, why don't you put something in the chat and Heather and I will work it out, but you should be able now to see uh, a little presentation. It says South Bank Whiskey, Northern Kentucky Distilleries in the first golden age of bourbon. And I say first because those of us in the bourbon industry and those of us who are bourbon lovers uh, tend to think we are in a, a new golden age of, of American whiskey and a golden age for Kentucky bourbon as uh, the popularity of our product is, is just surging and distilleries are making more and more investing billions of dollars in new production to satisfy drinkers all over the world. Styles of whiskey like rye whiskey that were dormant and almost extinct have come back with a vengeance. Uh, and there's, there's more distillers than we've had almost in American history uh, across the nation, many of whom making bourbon. So uh, it's a new uh, golden age of whiskey, we think. And uh, I want to talk about uh, not only Northern Kentucky's history, but to place it in the context of what was really going on in this area, which was that the whiskey capital of America at this time, this would be 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up into the uh, early 20th century. The whiskey capital, the number one whiskey mart in the country was our own Greater Cincinnati. Um, it was Cincinnati that was uh, the center of the industry. We didn't have the most distilleries, but we had a lot of distilleries. We didn't have the most of them, but we were the center of where 
that uh, that industry lay. And in fact, uh, in downtown Cincinnati, there were dozens, scores of companies that were whiskey companies, often that owned the distilleries that were further south in Kentucky. Many of those famous names that are still in production today were owned by a, a, a Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky um, a whiskey company. And the whiskey came to Cincinnati and from there it was bottled and went out to the world and down the Ohio River on the boats to, uh, to New Orleans and other places. So uh, this is, is where, where whiskey was really happening in America. Sadly, as I alluded to earlier, uh, Cincinnati was, was also the center of the rectifying industry, of the blending industry, where the distilleries would take uh, perhaps good Kentucky bourbon and uh, blend it with other alcohols and other spirits and flavor it with all sorts of things, some of them not very savory, like, like uh, copper sulfate or uh, iodine or beading oil to give it that special something. Some terrible uh, concoctions got put out there and were called whiskey. This was the product that the Kentucky distillers were sort of rebelling against when they went and made the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. And sadly, it was our metropolis that was responsible for it. The Kentucky distillers did not care for this greater Cincinnati, this Cincinnati whiskey, they called it, and they, they fought against it. So um, we, uh, we want to call a spade a spade and tell the truth about uh, how it all went down. Um, so um, we have uh, a whole bunch of distilleries all over the place. Um, in uh, some of them in Cincinnati, there was this one down here at the Mill Creek. There was Clifton Springs in uh, Cumminsville or Northside, what we would today call Northside. I'm gonna talk about some of these. Uh, I have several bottles from this man that made whiskey in Carthage, uh, the Carthage neighborhood in Cincinnati. His name was Ed Brinkman. I have some of these bottles right behind me here in my home office and it's good stuff, okay? It wasn't bad whiskey. We made good whiskey in greater Cincinnati. Uh, as you cross the distillery, there were a host of other, uh, across the river, there were a host of other places to go. Boone County uh, was a very large distillery at one point, the largest in the, in the state in Petersburg, Kentucky. Uh, we had James B. Walsh on the riverfront of Covington. Latonia had a distillery. Um, there was a, a, a number of them. So I'm going to walk you through uh, just a few of these um, classic places and we can start to see a little what they're like. Um, here we have Rossville Distillery. This is in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And this site is the only place uh, today that is historically still active in whiskey production in greater Cincinnati. This distillery was founded in 1857 in Lawrenceburg. Uh, it was called Rossville. It had multiple owners over the years. At this point that this uh, this lithograph was made, and this was an advertisement really for Rossville. Uh, it was owned by the James Walsh Company and uh, had some multiple owners over the years, including eventually George Remus had a partial stake in this distillery uh, after Prohibition. So th this is no small affair. Look at this thing. They've got uh, multiple silos in the back full of grain. They've got uh, substantial uh, warehouses and everything. It, it's, it's no small, nothing to sneeze at here. Uh, we'll see some even bigger ones in a moment. And from this Rossville, eventually down, down, down the, the decades became today what we know in uh, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, which is the old Seagram's distillery. Today, this is owned by a company called MGP. This is a Titanic distillery. Um, and they like to mention the fact that, oh, it goes back to 1857. Seagram's as a company did not go back to 1857, but this distillery did. And they called that out here in the brickwork on their warehouses. Like I said today, it is a very large place. So uh, folks, I, I meet people who grew up in Lawrenceburg and um, mentioned the distillery out there. And it's lost on us that this place is actually well over 150 years, uh, 170 years approximately in operation at this site. Uh, of course, the original uh, distillery building is, is now completely gone, uh, but it, it started a long time ago. Here is another one, the Freiburg and Workham Distillery in Lynchburg, Ohio. Lynchburg, uh, if you know, is uh, up about 45, 50 minutes away from Cincinnati. It's on the Little Miami River. Uh, if we look at this lithograph, look at this place. It's huge. It dominates the whole city. They have these large warehouses. Uh, multiple distilling houses over here. This, if you can see my cursor right here, this is the Little Miami River. 
and we have a railroad. This is beginning a theme I'm going to play out for you here, but, but many of these distilleries are situated where they had uh, transportation of, of, of both water and rail. And so we've got, uh, we've got the Little Miami River, we have got uh, uh, a rail yard go railroad going right through the distillery, taking in barrels and out barrels and grain and, and everything that goes on in making uh, whiskey. Freiburg and Workham, today completely gone, except there is about one small building right about here uh, that is uh, still in existence. But it's uh, a sad theme that almost, we'll, as we'll see, almost everything uh, infrastructure wise in, in Northern Kentucky and greater Cincinnati's whiskey history is now completely gone. This is my personal favorite. This is Clifton Springs Distillery. Uh, this uh, was situated literally down the, down the road from where I grew up in the neighborhood of Clifton uh, in Cincinnati. Um, if you uh, 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 know this area, it's today would be called Northside. Technically, this is actually a piece of the Clifton neighborhood. Uh, but again, who knew there was this substantial whiskey factory in a neighborhood today that we call Northside. Um, it, it blows my mind to find out, out about these things. In Cincinnati, you grew up here, you, you learned about greater Cincinnati, you hear about the great beer town that we were. And there was the Christian Moorline Brewery and all these breweries in Cincinnati, Wiedemann, big brewery in, um, in Newport. Uh, of course, there's the uh, Bavarian Brewery. We still have the building of that, thankfully, in uh, Covington. We never heard growing up I never heard about all the whiskey that was made here and all the whiskey companies. And I'm a whiskey freak. I'm a whiskey nerd. I should have heard about these things and I never did. It took me years to, to uncover some of this history. So here's Clifton Springs. Once again, we have uh, a, a waterway down at the very bottom of the picture is the Mill Creek. And in the center of the, of the, of the lithograph, you can see a railroad running right through it. That railroad is still there. You know, two things that never move over history are uh, waterways and railways. You can you can find a lot of things on maps by pinning them to the, the rivers and the streams and the, and the canals and to the railroads that are still there. And then you can't see it here at Clifton Springs, but on the other side of those buildings in the background is the Miami Erie Canal, which is today Interstate 75 and uh, Central Parkway in Cincinnati. So again, they had multiple transportation modes coming into the distillery. They had the Mill Creek, they had a railroad, they had the Miami Erie Canal. They even ran uh, flatboats uh, up and down the Miami Erie to take barrels from Clifton Springs to uh, downtown Cincinnati from where they would go out uh, to the world. Uh, I have some whiskey from this distillery also, and it's good stuff. It is, it is perfectly excellent whiskey. Uh, and tasty even today. This is, if anyone would like to uh, earn a, a bonus point, uh, unrelated, by the way, to our trivia question, uh, which I'll explain in a, in a second. Um, oh, here we are. Uh, the trivia question is in here from uh, Berger Crawford. Um, and uh, uh, we, uh, this is called a uh, Sanborn map. And I was blown away to discover these Sanborn maps. Some of you amateur historians out there, I'm sure have run across them as well. But these were maps commissioned by the Sanborn company that went all around, uh, all around the country and mapped and drew in exacting detail, drew out entire city blocks at a time. And they were, they were created for the purposes of fire insurance. So that in the event of a fire, they not only knew, um, uh, what was there and what might have been lost, but they had a record of, if you delve into the detail and you look here at this Sanborn map, you can see things like fire hydrants, pump hoses, uh, how many horsepower pumps were available to deliver water to the site of a fire. The Sanborn company wanted to represent all of this to the insurance agencies that were their clients. And so today we've got decades of these maps that show in exacting detail um, what used to be uh, all over our infrastructure. So once again, here we have got the Miami Canal. We have uh, the railroad coming right through the center of it all, the Mill Creek. And in the center of all that is uh, this distillery apparatus, uh, fermenting room and multiple stills that they had, uh, these large warehouses. This distillery uh, was, was uh, active up to prohibition and it shuttered after that. The building stood 
uh, up until about 1980, when there was a fire, be more fires before our discussion is done tonight, uh, in one of these buildings. And uh, at the time, it was being used as a furniture warehouse. And after that, it was completely torn down, as I think the firefighters said, we do not want to deal with these 100 plus year old buildings anymore. Uh, so it was standing uh, until I was a, a young boy in, uh, in my neighborhood. I do not remember it. I never knew to look for it. I was just a kid. I was 10 years old. So yeah, Clifton Springs, if you go to, to Northside today and you drive over the Ludlow Viaduct and you turn a hard right, you pass a White Castle and you come to a dead end into um, uh, the, the, the road there, you would be staring at this time, staring across the Mill Creek into the face of Clifton Springs distilling. Look at this place. It's a major uh, piece of industrialism uh, right here in uh, my old neighborhood. So we had no idea this kind of thing was here. Oh, look at this. I thought the Behringer Crawford was a family event. And now we have gratuitous sexual content. Oh, this is awful. Folks, I'm putting this in here to point out how much the bones of our past and of, of, of Cincinnati's whiskey past come up sometimes where you don't even expect it. Here, my wife and I are taking our, our family photos for that year uh, at Smale Park on the Cincinnati Riverfront. And we sat down on this, uh, these, these stone foundations that were uncovered in the construction of Smale Park, and they were preserved. And this uh, particular uh, uh, little uh, foundation we're sitting on dates to the 1840s. And in fact, in, over its time from the 1840s, probably up to close to the Civil War, it served as a whiskey rectifying house. It was a whiskey blender's establishment back in those days. So you never know where th this history is going to be poking up. And here we were just sitting on it. We had no idea. Uh, it's out there if you know where to look. Look at this. James Walsh and Company. Uh, this is an example of a uh, whiskey company par excellence in uh, greater Cincinnati uh, at the end of the, of the 19th century. They were distillers. Uh, they were blenders. They were redistillers. That means that they would take uh, sort of a raw farm whiskey from small farm distilleries in all over uh, Kentucky, but also all over Ohio, pardon me, all over Indiana. Uh, farmers would send their very rough distillate down to a place like uh, Walsh, a redistiller, and they would redistill it basically into what today we would call grain neutral spirits, or what they called, if you look down in the left hand corner, it says, premier double run cologne spirits. That means a neutral spirit that you could go and make something like cologne and all of the industrial products that uh, benefit from, from spirits. So this is a redistilling house on the banks of the Ohio River at Covington. Look at this thing. It's a, it's a city, it's a square city block. Who knew we had this here? It's, it's Titanic. Uh, we see river boats in the front. We see all these barrels uh, on the quay and the riverfront being ready to be loaded onto boats and taken out to the world. Uh, this place suffered numerous fires. I think it was probably gone well before Prohibition, but uh, this was a significant company in, in Covington. And this is at least as large as something like the, the Wiedemann Brewery in Newport. And uh, again, we have no idea uh, that it was existing. So perfect example of uh, those rectifiers. They are compounders. You know, some of this stuff is good whiskey they make. Some of it is, you probably wouldn't recognize it as whiskey uh, today. So there's James Walsh. Um, today, uh, where is James Walsh located? What, what, what is on this site? The River Center at Covington, right there. Under all this would be, you know, foundations of that distillery right next to uh, the only bridge at the time, of course, the uh, convention, or the uh, suspension bridge uh, right there. Uh, hard to believe. So here's another little place I want to show you. Uh, Latonia Distillery. We have no photographs of this uh, that I can find anyway. Uh, this is in um, uh, uh, Latonia, right on the river, uh, right on the Licking River, and also, once again, right on the, uh, the railroad uh, that sits there still. So here's a, a genuine uh, Kenton County uh, distillery. Uh, again, look at all of these warehouses they have right there along the railroad. And look also to the yellow object uh, at the left, cattle shed. Um, 
it is a an ongoing problem today. I won't say a problem. It's a, a challenge uh, making whiskey to get rid of the the uh, spent grains. After we make all those grains into all that whiskey, you got to get rid of the grains. And unlike they might have done back in these days, it's unacceptable to just dump it into the river. Uh, so at, in the case of New Rift, we send it away to a farmer and it gets fed by fed to cows uh, here in northern Kentucky. Uh, back in the day, it, it got taken away by farmers. But you also were at that time, it was just so convenient. You had your own cattle shed. <laughs> if you've been to New Riff and if you haven't, please come and pay a visit. You'll see it's in the uh, in on the same property as the party source. We share the parking lot with the party source. There's times where I think we all wish making whiskey at New Riff, we could have a cattle shed instead of a parking lot because uh, of the need to get rid of our uh, of our stillage is what we call it, the stillage. But back in those days, you just had a, a cattle shed and you you fed the, the slop, as they called it, to the cattle. Um, today, uh, where is this and what's going on there? Here is the Latonia site today. And we have, um, once again, the Licking River, the railroad going across it. And if you can zoom in on Google Earth, or probably if you care to go and walk this land, you can probably, you can still see here some of the foundations, some of the stoneworks of where that distillery was. Uh, these folks on Summit Drive in Latonia have got the, the, the uh, uh, ruins of an old distillery in their backyard. They may not even know it. Um, right across the river, we will go to our next uh, site. And uh, if we take this choo-choo train right across the river into Wilder, we come to this, uh, this green little woods here at the very southern end of, of Wilder, at the very southern end of the steel plant in Wilder. And you'll note that there are these, that there's this pond here. Probably that's a pretty good fishing hole for the steel workers. But back in the day, it was part of the Pebbleford Distillery. Took me a long time to figure out where this Pebbleford Distillery was, but I finally solved it and it was in Wilder. It was again right on the, uh, the river and right on the rail line. And this place operated up to Prohibition. Uh, it shut down after, at Prohibition, of course, and it was resuscitated uh, by the Shenley Corporation. Shenley was one of the large, uh, uh, large uh, national firms in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, making uh, whiskey. Shenley was one of the large corporations, national uh, distillers, which had its headquarters in Cincinnati. No coincidence, by the way. Uh, of course, it, it came up where the, the whiskey uh, industry used to be headquartered, but national distillers was another example uh, where my dad used to work. And uh, here in uh, Pebbleford, this was owned by Shenley. It's sometimes referred to as the JTS Brown Distillery because some of the product they made went to the JTS Brown brand. But properly, this was always called uh, Pebbleford. And it ran up uh, probably into the mid 1950s before being shut down. Um, and uh, it was shut down. Here's the Sanborn map for this. Uh, after, of course, a fire, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but again, we have got these ponds. If you see the, the blue circles to the left, they say on their cooling ponds. That's a place where the distillery could either draw cold water or transfer their hot water to cool down over time. And that was how they, how they handled uh, cooling water for their distillery. Every distillery uses a lot of water, mostly in the cooling of all of the boiling that we do. We have to cool things down. And so in the case of many distilleries, they had a cooling pond and they do uh, here at Pebbleford. Uh, what happened to Pebbleford? A fire uh, took out, uh, it was a 1946 fire and they recovered after that, but it, it probably wasn't really a, a, a excellent place to run a distillery anymore. And uh, Shenley shut it down, I believe in the, in the early fifties. Uh, here is uh, that site again with that still extant uh, cooling pond. And once again, if you go and walk this site, you can find some of the, the foundations, uh, square foundations still there on the land from the warehouses and other things that they had. Um, so that is uh, Pebbleford uh, here in Campbell County. The most significant distillery in Campbell County uh, would have been Old 76. Uh, this is a neat place. This is um, in a, uh, a, a, a burg, or a village completely forgotten today called Finchtown. I bet no one remembers or, or heard of Finchtown growing up. Uh, it was a, a little tiny community 
sort of between what is Newport and Wilder today. It was subsumed into uh, Newport, I think, in the 1930s. And today, uh, just absolutely forgotten, Finchtown. This uh, was Finchtown Road that you see here. Today, that's Route 9. And once again, we see the railroad, which is still there. We see the Licking River and uh, Old 76. So imagine driving south out of Newport on Route 9 in your, your uh, horse and buggy, probably. And look what you pass, this tremendous whiskey distillery infrastructure. Uh, this was a significant distillery of the time. Uh, we see, um, it says the old 76 distilling company on this tall building, that would have been grain handling. Um, they had um, uh, a distilling plant, which is across uh, the street. So they had to conduct the grain across the street. There are some pipes going there between the two. The smokestacks represent the uh, boiler room that powered the whole place. And to the north, you see multiple large multi-story warehouses. Uh, today, all of it gone except for one uh, building I'll show you in a moment. Here's another view. Um, again, the Licking River, the railroad, today's Route 9, and this uh, significant uh, distillery, bunch of distillery buildings that they had there. Here is their uh, Sanborn map. Once again, we see cattle sheds, we see warehouses, we see um, the distilling room. Uh, we see that uh, they had uh, right up here by the railroad bridge, that it's on the left of the screen, uh, right up there by the railroad bridge, they had this pink building on this map, which is a redistilling house for um, Old 76. So Old 76 would bring in on this um, uh, rail line, they would bring in grain, and they would also bring in barrels of uh, un unfinished whiskey, unfinished spirits, and they would truck them up this railroad spur all the way to their redistilling house, which is today uh, more or less on the site of uh, uh, River Metals, that metal recycling plant in Newport uh, is more or less on the site of that today. So uh, significant distillery uh, in Newport, at the, in, in Finchtown, and what we today would call uh, Newport, I think. And look at this photo. This is amazing. This was um, taken, I don't know when, but it is uh, probably 18... 80s, maybe 1890s. Uh, I can tell that or, or estimate that by how big Old 76 has grown to this point, but it would get a little bit bigger than that. Uh, look at this, this action going on here. These people in the, in the boat, do you think the fish were biting that day on the Licking River? Do you think they looked up and saw themselves being photographed? And here we are looking at them after all this. It also makes me think, man, the 19th century was filthy. Look at this. It, it, it looks pretty run down. It looks like there could be a fire there any minute. And uh, considering some of these, uh, the buildings here, like the building in the very center that has almost a porch on it, that is actually a tavern uh, that was um, operating on the premises. Uh, how convenient to have a tavern right next to a whiskey distillery. But uh, typical of the construction of the day, those, those buildings were often not well built. And no wonder that they would uh, succumb often to what happened in, in fact, uh, in the case of Old 76, you can see where I'm going with this. Here is um, an example of the railroad spur that goes up to their redistilling house and this uh, large uh, warehouse that they have here. I don't have a date on this picture. I would guess again, 1890s uh, or maybe 1900 or so. And what happened to Old 76? Boom. They had multiple fires here. They had a, a bad fire in, uh, 1870, and uh, I think another modest one in, uh, in the 1880s. And then in 1907, uh, a major fire. Uh, it didn't, uh, no one died in this, but it took, as it states here, firemen from three cities to put it out. They came from Newport and Covington, came across the river from Cincinnati to uh, try and save some of this. And it, uh, it, it was, the writing on the wall is that this is just not going to work. Uh, here we are in this town, uh, growing town, of uh, Finchtown or Newport, and we keep having these fires again and again. Uh, safety and, and electrical protocols and everything about the world back then was, was not as fire resistant as it is today, unfortunately. The only fatality in this, kind of a sad story, down at the bottom here, it says, uh, boy dropped dead running to fire. And this 18-year-old man, Louis Berger, was uh, 
saw all the fuss and the commotion and all these people running to see the, the flames could be seen across the river from uh, from Covington. They lit up the night sky. It, it was looked like an absolute conflagration. And he was running to it and had a heart condition and died. Poor man. He was the only uh, fatality in this. Uh, and he, he died just running to it, uh, unfortunately. Here is the only remaining uh, infrastructure of, to my knowledge, of a Northern Kentucky uh, distillery today. This is the warehouse, uh, one of the warehouses. I'll go back to the slide. Um, this warehouse, right. Can you see my cursor? Right here. This is the location of that warehouse. Although I'm not 100% certain that this building is the same as that building, but that's the location. I think the original might have burned down and they, they rebuilt it. Uh, but that warehouse is the same as this one right here. If you go driving south on Route 9, you, you come out of Newport, you go under the railroad bridge, you go over the hill and uh, you pass. This is on the, the east side of the road. That is an old whiskey warehouse. Every time you go past it, everybody, I want you to honk your horn. Give it a little toot of your horn. Say hello to the the old whiskey spirits there. Um, if you note, back to the issue of, um, of uh, slaughterhouses and, and uh, well, or, or, or cow yards and, and cattle sheds, many distilleries also had associated with them a slaughterhouse because if, if an animal died or, or got injured, you needed to have a place to, to handle uh, that and, uh, and send it out to the world in the form of, of beef. And there was a, a slaughterhouse in these buildings right here at the very bottom of the picture. Uh, if anyone would like to put in the chat, what are those uh, buildings today? I think some of you might have been there. It's haunted. And the story of, yes, Bobby Mackey's is that it is built on the site of an old slaughterhouse. Yeah, it's, it's the site of an old whiskey distillery slaughterhouse. Today, we, we've, again, completely forgotten it. But that is the origin of the slaughterhouse that underpins the, the haunted myths about um, about uh, uh, Bobby Mackey's. So um, that's an interesting little trivia that I, I bet most of the, the ghost hunters and so on uh, didn't actually know about. And happily now we have some distilleries back in town. So we had uh, the old Pogue distillery that opened, I want to say in 2011, where they actually got back to distilling whiskey, the Pogue family of Maysville. New Riff opened in 2014. Uh, we had um, Boone County Distilling that opened uh, a few years after that, and uh, Second Sight Spirits in Ludlow is the fourth distillery here in Northern Kentucky. We are all part of the Bee Line, which is the Northern Kentucky Tourism Board's uh, promotional effort for uh, Northern Kentucky whiskey tourism. The Bee Line includes the four distilleries as well as a host of hotels, restaurants, bars, people that are delivering bourbon culture into uh, Northern Kentucky and do so at a high level. So there's another topic here to go on that I don't always present, but I know you guys will find it interesting. Uh, so here is our distillery. Uh, this is in the very northeast corner of Newport, uh, literally on the, the border of it. If, if you see the curb there at New Rift Distilling, that curb is the demarcation between Newport and Bellevue. If you're standing in the parking lot, you're in Newport. If you step onto the curb, you're, I'm sorry, if you're standing in the parking lot, you're in Bellevue. If you step onto the curb, you go into Newport. So we are in the very northeast corner of Newport and in the very southwest opposite corner all the way the other way in Newport, you find our West Campus Warehouse. And this is uh, familiar to many uh, Newporters and, and North Kentuckians. This is what folks called the trolley barn. This is the old Green Line streetcar uh, warehouses. There are three of these. Uh, standing today, of which New Riff owns and cares for two of them. And uh, these were, as you may know, you can see the date on the building there, 1904. These were built from the 1890s on and carry various dates. They were added on to over many years. And so there's, there's different dates as you walk around the property. Um, this uh, portion was the uh, uh, power generating source uh, uh, station for the streetcar company back in those days and where they had some, some giant uh, beam steam engines that produced this electricity. It was also the site in, in the terms of trolley barn where they, uh, it was a barn literally for those streetcars. They would bring them in, work on them, 
do an oil change, they'd adjust whatever they have to adjust, paint them, uh, repair the fittings. It, they were repair shops for um, the, uh, the warehouses. So I thought you guys would find it interesting to walk through a little bit of this and see, uh, see what it looked like in our history and tenure of, of care of these buildings. Um, we moved into this building. Uh, we leased it in 2014. Several years after that, we bought it. And later we bought the building next door. When we moved in, they had been vacant for uh, about 10 or 12 years. And the last company in it before us was a glass tempering facility. And so we moved in and it looked something like this. Um, on the east side, which we were just looking at from the 1890s, we had this very large room. Uh, the power generating station was to the left. And uh, I don't know what was going on in the rest of it here for uh, the streetcars, but this is, is a large and tremendous ceiling in this place. It's really got a lot of atmosphere. You know, part of the fun of it all for me is as an architecture buff as well, we've got the, the modern stainless steel and, and gleaming glass building of the distillery. Uh, and then on the other side of town, we're inhabiting the 19th century and taking care of that and, and uh, letting it live and everything. So as you see, this was empty and boarded up and um, pretty dirty all over the place. Uh, here on the west side of uh, this um, building is a, a 1946 vintage building that uh, has this uh, lattice work, these, these, this span of metalwork over the top and wonderful uh, redwood ceiling that we have in there. Looks like an airplane hangar. It was built for buses primarily. That's why we see all these garage doors. These are garage doors that they would drive the buses in and work on them and, and send them back out on their runs. Um, so we uh, inhabited these, they were empty. Uh, we started rolling in a few barrels. First barrels of whiskey in Newport in a long, long time. Uh, these are some of our first batches. We were just starting to store them. And it's, it didn't seem to take very long before the place looked like this. And it was full, full, full of barrels packed to the brim. Uh, we, uh, after, in, in the course of this, we bought the building next door. We started to fill that up with barrels as well. Uh, eventually we renovated the, uh, the older spaces into uh, offices and a bottling line and uh, finished goods storage where we, we store our finished whiskey, also where we store our glass and our materials to package our empty bottles and things like that are stored in these buildings. Um, and uh, today it looks something like this probably the best this whiskey, this building has ever looked, but this is our tasting room. Um, it's where we have uh, clients from all over the country and the world come to pick out private barrels of whiskey. We entertain clients here and we show it off on tours and things like that. And uh, we, we renovated it, but we left a lot of the, the bones and the, the, uh, the character of the building. We didn't want to whitewash all of this. It, 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 it's okay if it looks 135 years old. Um, that is uh, our, our tasting warehouse and uh, uh, relevant, I know, to the Behringer because the Behringer has got the last streetcar that ran on the Green Line. Um, as the story was told to me by um, uh, your, uh, uh, one of your uh, uh, museum uh, curators, uh, it was, I think, July, I want to say July of 19, early 50s, 1950, 51, I don't remember the exact year, 54 maybe. And the last streetcar ran on uh, something like Friday. And by the, by the following Tuesday, they had got that thing into the Behringer where it has been ever since. So I propose we have a party there someday. Let's get together with some bottles of New Riff and uh, raise a toast to our mutual good health and fortune. And uh, wanna thank you again for having us, having me here tonight. And we'll get into our Q&A session now. Uh, if uh, folks have any questions, the address on Route 9 of the old 76, I do not know the address, no. Um, it could easily be looked up in the uh, county, uh, uh, Campbell County Clerk of Courts. I've looked it up before, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, if you were thinking of buying it, forget it. Keep your hands off that building, people. I want that building. I want to make a, a, a Northern Kentucky Whiskey Museum in that building. So that's what we should do with that building. Uh, I have met, I haven't met the owner, but we, uh, we did meet uh, one of the tenants 
And actually a bunch of us from New Rift toured that building uh, many years ago as we were searching for a home for barrels. And uh, uh, maybe we will buy it someday. But right now it is full of various companies, including um, substantially, I think, one of the uh, legal document storage. One of those places where legal documents go to live uh, until they're not needed anymore. So that's one of the things that I know is being stored in that old warehouse. How many gallons in a whiskey barrel? Well, that, that depends on the barrel, but uh, in a standard Kentucky style barrel, it's 53 gallons. That is the size today. That's, that's what we use at, at New Riff is full size uh, whiskey barrels. Okay, um, before we get any more questions and do we wanna go over the trivia question a little bit? Sure. Um, um, I think we saw someone submitted a, uh, an answer here. Yes. Um, Sheila Everson replies, it took her all of about two seconds. Uh, <laughs> the answer was 10 and Sheila is correct. Uh, we, uh, we annually enter, uh, we, we, we don't enter a lot of whiskey competitions, of spirits competitions at New Rift. We, we don't care about winning a lot of medals. We just wanna win the right medals. And we submit to what we think is the most prestigious uh, in the world spirits competition. It's called the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. And it's the best of the best. And uh, it's held annually. We, um, we enter it every year since 2019. And uh, this year we submitted 10 entries and we got nine gold medals and one double gold medal. So we ran the table on the, the best stage in the world for gold medals. Uh, another excellent showing for us at San Francisco World Spirits Competition. And indeed, Sheila, it was 10 medals. Thank you. Um, people, we do have a couple minutes left. So if people want to start thinking of questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, in the meantime, do you want to talk about maybe how you decided to um, start New Riff or right. maybe where the name came from a little bit? Right. Uh, well, we started New Riff. Uh, Ken Lewis was the owner uh, of the party source and um, uh, is, uh, uh, was my, I'm still my boss. He's a great guy and, and a friend. And uh, I've worked for him since 2001. And basically to make a long story short, between the two of us with what I was doing in Fine Spirits and in Kentucky Bourbon Projects and with Ken's, Ken is one of those amazing American entrepreneurs uh, that our country seems to make to grow up from time to time. And Ken's uh, field of entrepreneurship was, was alcoholic beverage retailing. And he had the vision to, to think we could do this ourselves. He says it was my idea. I know it was his idea because I never went to him and said, Mr. Lewis, uh, I think it'd be a great idea if you sold the store and put a distillery in the parking lot. I never said that. But between the two of us, we birthed the idea that we should uh, put this distillery there. And it was Ken that uh, came up with the name. The name, as, as it says on the back of the bottle, a new riff on an old tradition. Can you see that there? Yeah, a new riff. And it, it means that it's, it's like a guitar riff, right? Like, like a jazz riff. We know the old tradition, which is Kentucky sour mash whiskey making, uh, but we, we play a new riff on it. We, we change it up a little, a little from time to time. And uh, over the years, those riffs will get heavier and heavier and heavier. Um, and uh, that's the, the essence of the, uh, of the name, uh, New Riff. Uh -huh. Question, does it have to be distilled in Kentucky to be called bourbon? Uh, Mark uh, Koenig, no, uh, Mr. Koenig, it needs to be distilled in any of the 50 American states. Um, it comes from Kentucky, however. Uh, obviously we are the, the native source of it and, and where it was created and where its identity was formed. But uh, for a long time, there have been substantial amounts of bourbon made in, well, Indiana. We started off tonight looking in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. That's still a titanic distillery making fantastic whiskey. Um, in uh, Ohio, had lots of distilleries. Illinois, Peoria, Illinois, uh, Weston, Missouri, um, all over the Midwest and, and the Ohio, the really Mississippi River Valleys, Tennessee made bourbon, although eventually they wanted to call it Tennessee whiskey to set themselves apart from the real whiskey. In, in America, which is, is Kentucky bourbon. So no, it has to be made in America in one of the 50 states. Of the four Green Line warehouses, uh, we own two and there are three to my knowledge. Um, I don't know of any more. Um, the fourth is right across the road from us 
I, I wish we had been able to get that ourselves and renovate it, but it just didn't work for us at the time and it needed a lot of work. It probably wasn't the, the best uh, one of the warehouses to be storing barrels in. Uh, the others are, are much better for that. But I, I know that other warehouse. Um, it's owned today by, and it was renovated uh, very successfully as far as I can tell, by uh, uh, a construction company. Uh, is their name Presser or Dresser or something like that? But I, I forget them often. I haven't met them actually, but uh, there are our next door neighbors across uh, across uh, Lowell Avenue, uh, Lowell Street there in Louisville and in, in Newport. And um, they thankfully have saved that building as well. Um, and uh, so it's it's doing great that other that other place. Fetters, thank you. Fetters is the name of it. Yes, Fetters uh, Construction bought the uh, other building and renovated it. I think they have events in there and things too. I should go in and say hi, take them a bottle of whiskey. We do have a couple more minutes. If anybody else has more questions, um, go bet. ahead and put them in the chat. Um, oh, okay. We had one. What is the highest proof that can be sold in the US? Well, bourbon is not constrained on the higher limits of proof. Um, it is constrained on the lower limits of proof. It has to be bottled at no more, no less than 80 proof. Um, but on the upper end, there's no limit um, to um, how, uh, how high it can be sold. Um, typically, uh, it is watered down to 80 or 90 or 100 proof. Um, it goes in the barrel at a maximum of 125. So if we talk about, for example, uh, here is a bottle of New Riff single barrel bourbon, and this is bottled at, it says here, can you read it, barrel proof. So when whiskeys are sold at barrel proof, they are uh, undiluted with water, uncut with water, and bottled at the natural strength that was attained in the barrel during aging. Because the upper limit of uh, what, a, what a barrel can be filled at is 125 proof, then some barrels over the years will rise in proof depending on where they are stored in the warehouse. And they might rise to 130 or 135 proof. Um, there are some out there that, that some barrel proof bourbons rarely would exceed 140 proof. Um, the legal maximum for transport on an airplane I know is 140 proof. So there's um, a few uh, bourbon, uh, bourbon or other whiskeys out there that are, that are bottled so high that you can't carry them on, put them in your luggage, for example. Um, but those are, are few and far between. So what could not happen is that the proof could be increased by, um, by any other means. It, you can't say, well, I, I'd really like to make 180 proof bourbon. Well, it's gotta get there naturally, right? And it just doesn't get much up above 140 and, that, and that's in a rare circumstance. In the case, for what it's worth of New Riff, uh, we go in the barrel at a very low uh, 110 proof. And so over four years of aging, our whiskey might go up a little bit to maybe 114 go or ahead. go down a little bit to like 107. Why are the barrels stored on their sides? Well, uh, they're stored that way because historically that's a very easy way to roll them around, of course, and, and store them. And so they are rolled into the warehouse and stored in, in wooden ricks. And they're stored on their side because that's easy to get them in and out. Historically, it would be much harder to, to move a barrel uh, standing up. You always roll a barrel. That's the point of a barrel. Um, they're uh, stored on their sides with the bung up. The bung is the hole that is drilled in the barrel to, to let, let it be filled with, with spirit. And they're stored with the bung up so that that doesn't uh, possibly leak out. Uh, however, today, uh, it is possible to palletize uh, barrel storage as well, where they stand upright and sit four per pallet uh, and are stored and put away with a, a forklift. And uh, that works too. It all still makes good whiskey at the end of the day. Did the Northern Kentucky Symphony have a concert in one of your warehouses? Yes, they did. Uh, I don't remember when that was exactly. I want to say 2018, um, maybe not too long after the release of our whiskey. It was well before uh, the pandemic would have shut all that stuff down, but yeah, they had a, they had a concert there. It's pretty cool. Okay. We probably have time for one more question. Um, if somebody wants to get one more question in. Um, 
otherwise, um, I'm gonna ask, um, you said you store, um, put your uh, whiskey in the barrel at 110 proof. Is there a reason why you do it lower than other people? Right, um, we do it because um, uh, we wanted to um, uh, attain some flavors at 110 that uh, we um, uh, thought we would miss at, um, at a higher proof. Um, at 125. It costs us in barrels to do this, by the way. If we make, when, when whiskey comes off our still, it's about exactly 135 proof. So if, if we make this much whiskey at 135 proof, we cut it to 125. Now we need this many barrels. If we cut it to 110, we need this many barrels. And so it costs us in wood to do this. But we're happy to do it because, again, we get these flavors that we liked at 110 proof. The other reason we did it is that our research indicated the whiskey would taste better at a lower barreling proof. And it would taste better younger. That was the important part. Younger, it tastes better younger at the lower proof. Well, when we make a, a four-year-old bourbon, if you see here, our whiskeys always have an age statement on the back, aged at least four years. We needed this four-year-old bourbon to be banging. We needed this to be fantastic. Maybe even to go, oh, I don't know, to the San Francisco World Spirits Competition and win gold medals. So we were happy to... Uh, barrel at a lower proof if it would help us attain the quality that we needed right out of the gate. And I dare say it worked when you run the, run the table with uh, gold medals at the San Francisco competition. So, okay. All right. um, so we are going to go over just a few reminders for people before we um, end the presentation tonight. Um, our special exhibits at the Barringer Copper Museum, um, Spirit Riders, Abracadabra, Two Day History and our Harlan Hubbard exhibit um, will be closing on April 24th. So if you wanna see those exhibits before they leave, um, make sure you get in within the next couple of days. Um, so also that's all we have for this evening. Thank you again to all of our sponsors and supporters of BCM. Um, thanks to the staff trustees and members of the Berenger Copper Museum as well. Um, for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installments of our curators chat with our curator of collections, Jason French, um, as well as all the previous history hours and um, pretty soon this history hour, if you missed anything. Um, so please like and subscribe on those videos. Um, as a reminder, there will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week as we continue our bi-weekly schedule, but we will be back on May 4th with uh, Kate McKenzie of the Kenton County Public Library on Northern Kentucky music history. Until then, take care everyone and good night. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having us again. And may I ask anyone out there with a bottle of new riff, raise a toast to Northern Kentucky whiskey. Thank you. <laughs>